Good morning and welcome to West Kilbride Parish Church Online. And to our friends from Kirkgate and Sulcoats, we send a virtual hug. And a very warm, warm welcome to everyone joining us online from wherever in the world you join us. We hope you enjoy the service and if you'd like to drop us a line, the contact details are on our website. For most people, the year 2020 has been a year of unprecedented change due to the impact of COVID-19. What is the new normal? And what everyday experiences do we find ourselves longing for just to help us feel like we are on solid ground? Back the way things were before lockdown happened. It is great that when all around us is shaking, we can rely on our Saviour and be reassured by his word. In the New Testament and in Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8, we find these words. Jesus doesn't change. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, he's always totally himself. God is good. God is love. Always. So let's all take time out to lift our hearts and lift our heads to worship him together, wherever we are. Our first hymn is, Great is Your Faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow. They fail not As you have been You forever will be Great is your faithfulness Great is your faithfulness Morning by morning New mercies I see Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to
great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, Lord God, to me. Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you with us this morning. Shall we just join our hearts and minds together in prayer? Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, it's good for us to still ourselves before you this day. We are grateful for the God that you are, and we want to come before you and to glorify your name and to lift your name high. We thank you, Lord God, that as we come before you, you know everything about us. You know when we sit and when we rise. You perceive our thoughts from afar. You are almighty God, and all things are in your hands. And so as we come before you this day, we want to glorify your name. We recognise, Lord God, that we are weak humanity, that we are but the dust, and our life is but a breath. And yet you are from everlasting to everlasting, and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whilst we often change with the wind, Loving Lord God, we thank you that you are an anchor for our soul and we can trust in you. We can trust in your character because you are the Holy One. You are the one who is loving and compassionate and you are the one who has removed our sins from us as far as the East is from the West. We thank you, Lord God, that though we were lost in our sin and in our transgressions, that you sent a saviour in the Lord Jesus. And you lifted us up from the miry clay and you set our feet upon the rock. Because in Jesus, we can know forgiveness for our sins. We can know hope. We can know reconciliation with you. And Father, we can know life, life in all its fullness and life everlasting. And we pray, Lord God, that as we are brought afresh to the cross, that we would not take these things for granted, that we would not take your love for granted, that we would not take your Holy Spirit for granted. But Heavenly Father, we would come with thankful and grateful hearts, that we would want to honour your name and to give you the glory and the praise. Loving Lord God, we recognise that when you come into our lives, then we are born again. We are made a new creation. And Lord God, you require us to live out a life to your glory and honour and praise. And we pray that we would do that among our family, among our friends, among our neighbours. We pray that glory would be brought to your name. Lord God, as we come before you, almighty God, we can only humble ourselves before you. We thank you, Lord God, that we can draw near to you. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, within our own church families here in West Kilbride and at Kirkgate, but also around our nation, around the world. We thank you for the many people who will be meeting together in your name today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you that no matter what we're feeling, whether we're up or we're down or things are going well or things are difficult, that we can always seek after you. We ask you would hear us now as we pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, young people. It's good to have you with us as usual this morning. Now, this morning marks a milestone. You might not realise that, but we have actually completed year one of a two-year programme called God's Big Story. One Big Story, uh, it's called. Now, the, the Bible is really, really important to Christians, isn't it? And what we've been trying to do over these pa this past year or so we actually started looking at one big story uh, on the 25th of August 2019, uh, so just about 11 months ago. And this morning we completed year one. And our aim during this past year is to give a kind of overview of what's in this book, what's in the Bible, uh, and what is the, the Christian story uh, all about. You see, the Bible is one big story. It tells how God created everything, created the world and everything in it and how everything was uh, good and very good right at the beginning of creation. Also tells of how uh, people messed up, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden and then uh, other people following them uh, all messed up as well. But it also tells us about how God had a plan to make everything right. And over this last year, uh, we've seen, uh, we've been going through the Old Testament mainly, we've still got a wee bit more of the Old Testament uh, to do, uh, and then we'll be moving into the New Testament, which is all about the coming of Jesus. So this morning we're going to think of uh, a wee bit of a recap over all that we've looked at uh, over the past year, so that you can try and fit together in your mind, how does all this uh, all fit together? Because it's not just been random stories, it all goes along and it points us towards Jesus. So we're going to look this morning uh, at some of the things we've looked at in the past year or so uh, and we're going to think a wee bit just about how they all come together. So let's have a wee think about the story of the Bible. One big story. The story of the Bible starts right back at the very beginning. It talks about how God made the world and everything in it and he said it was very good. Because God made the world, he was in charge of it. He was king. Unfortunately, it didn't stay very good for long, because people disobeyed God and chose not to follow his rules. They didn't want him to be king. Ever since then, there have been things that are wrong with the world. God could have given up on people, but he didn't. From the very beginning, he had a plan to sort out the mess of the world, and it began with a promise to a man called Abraham. Joseph was one of the people who came later in Abraham's family. He was taken to Egypt as a slave, but later he became a ruler in Egypt, and all his family moved there. Hundreds of years later, the Israelites were slaves. The Israelites was the name for the people from Abraham's family. By now, Abraham and Joseph had died, but the Israelites were a great nation, just like God had promised. God called Moses to rescue the Israelites and help them to escape from the Egyptians. Later, a man called Joshua led the Israelites into the land which God had promised to give to Abraham's family. That sounds like it should be the happy ending, but it wasn't because the people kept disobeying God. God still cared for them and he provided people called judges to lead them, people like Gideon and Samson. However, the people decided that they wanted a king, so God gave them kings. So far, in one big story, we've heard about three kings, Saul, David and Solomon. They did some good things, but none of these kings was perfect. The people were waiting for a perfect king who would lead them. Now, I hope you enjoyed that overview of the Bible and all that we've looked at over these past 11 months. Christians believe that God is the perfect king. And I want to read just a couple of verses from Psalm 47, verses 7 and 8. It says this, For God is the king 
of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. Right back at the beginning of the Bible, we read that God is the one who made the world. And this means that he knows the best way for people to live. But unfortunately, people didn't want to obey him. From Adam and Eve to many others throughout history, and the Israelites themselves constantly turned away from God. That caused a lot of problems when people didn't want God to be their king. And we actually see this in our world today when we look at the world around us or even when we look at our own lives. When we don't have God as king, then things tend to go pear-shaped. However, God is working out a plan and God is sending a solution. You see, we've only looked at parts of the Old Testament, so we've got a wee bit more of the Old Testament to do. But we've also got the whole of the New Testament to come as well, which tells us all about Jesus. Jesus is the solution for us to think about. Now, as we come to the end of this uh, first year of doing one big story, I want you just to think, would you rather let God be king in your life or would you rather to be king of your life? Now, I'm sure it seems quite attractive. Oh, I want to be king of my own life. I want to do my own thing. But I hope what we've learned is that actually, God knows better than we do. He knows all about us. He knows what we go through. And he's the one who loves us and cares for us. And the best way that we can live is by putting him first, making him king in our lives. Shall we just pray together? Let's pray. Loving Lord God, we thank you for all that we have looked at over these last 11 months. We thank you for all these stories which tell Lord God of how you created the world and yet how we made a complete mess of it, how we disobey you. And Lord God, I recognise that these are not just about people in the past, but as we look at these truths, we also understand something about our own heart, that we often disobey you and we follow our own way and want to do our own thing. And we ask for your forgiveness. Loving Lord God, we recognise that the people wanted a king, they had King Saul and King David and King Solomon, some kings better than others, and yet none of them was perfect. But we thank you that you were going to send an amazing king, a perfect king, King Jesus, the one who is not just a king, but also a saviour. And we thank you that we can put our faith and trust in him. And when we do, we can be assured that all will be well. So loving Lord God, speak to us. Through your word we pray, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, young folks, we're going to sing together now. And we're going to sing a song that we sung a few weeks ago now. We're going to sing One Way.
Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers and space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Amen. And we give thanks to God for his word. Last time when we were together, we were reflecting on one of those big questions. Who am I? This question of our identity. I spoke a little bit about the book, Sophie's World. How it happens in the book is simply this. Sophie checks out the mailbox at her house and she finds in it a simple envelope. And in the envelope, there is one piece of paper and on that piece of paper, three words only. Who are you? As Sophie reflects on that, she begins to realise she has no idea. She finds it odd to think that she really doesn't know who she is. I wonder if it's all that odd. I wonder if in fact it's true of many of us that we're not altogether sure just who we are. How would you answer if you picked up that envelope today, if it had been posted through your letterbox and you opened it and on that one piece of paper were those three questions, who are you? How would you answer? Last time out, I defined my identity by saying, first and foremost, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And flowing out of that, as I try to work out what it means to be a child of God, then I begin to think about my connectedness, my relationships to God himself, to other people, those around me, and to the very planet on which I live. That's at least the beginning of an answer to the question, who am I from a Christian point of view? Following on from the question, who am I? Which as we've said is about our identity. Following on comes this question, why am I here? Which is a question of purpose. What is the point of my existence? Is there any reason, is there any point in me being here? We all need at some point to work out our purpose. Of course, as a Christian, there are so many parts 
to that answer. And I'm sure it's not one against the other, but a combination of many of those different aspects. We could think, for example, back to Jesus when he called those first disciples, when he said to them, follow me and I will teach you to fish for people. Maybe that's part of our purpose. Yes, to follow Jesus and to fish for people, which is about embracing other people in the net of God's love expressed in Jesus or at the end of the Gospels when we find Jesus again with his followers, now after, of course, his death and rising again, and saying to them, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that they must obey. So surely that for the Christian will be part of our purpose, to go into all the world, to share good news of Jesus and to lead others into that life of following after him as his disciples. Or what about this as we consider further the question of our purpose? The very last verse that we heard read from the letter to the Ephesians this morning. God has made us what we are and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Sometimes people get a bit cagey when you begin to talk in these terms. Folks are wont to say, but we're not saved by doing good works, good deeds. No, of course not, and we don't need to go down that road. Clearly, it says just a little earlier in the passage, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. The amazing grace of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we are saved. So we're not saved by doing good works, good deeds. But it's abundantly clear in the passage that we are saved for a life of good deeds. The jaw-dropping part of this passage is when it says that God has already prepared in advance this life of good deeds for us, this life of good works and service. Folks, stop and think about that for a moment. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all things, bothers about us, about each one of us, and has plan and purpose for our lives. I wonder if at times folks are looking for perhaps something more dramatic. Well, maybe that comes but it isn't, isn't it a great starting point in terms of thinking about our purpose, why we're here? To think in terms of those good works that God has prepared for us to do? Seems to me that if we started there, we'd be on the right road. Maybe the way to begin is by simple acts of random kindness. I noticed in our town, just a street or so away from where we live, one household has put a cardboard box at their doorstep. It's been there pretty well throughout all of lockdown. And in that box, they put items one after another and there's a simple sign on it which says, please take anything that you need. Well, there's an act of random kindness. It warms my heart to see that kind of thing taking place. And two observations I make are these. Number one, do we have to stop those acts of kindness when we get back to something like normal and out of lockdown? I'd love to think that our communities would continue to be kind in those kind of ways. 
And the second observation is this. Of course, kindness is not restricted to Christian people or churches. Far from it. Many folks are showing kindness now. Many folks are engaging in these good works and good deeds. And I, for one, rejoice to see that. Acts of random kindness may be the starting point for us as we seek to put into action the purpose for which we've been created. But there's more to it for sure. We might at one moment be random and at the next very deliberate. And when it comes to that deliberate working out of our purpose, then I think we need look no further than what's offered to us by the prophet Micah, who encourages us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Now, when we begin to put these things together, then we have the beginning of a strategy, a deliberate way of living in terms of our purpose being enacted. What would this acting justly begin to look like in a world that is still so horribly divided? What would acting justly look like when some have so much and others next to nothing? What would acting justly look like in the face of, for example, this recent pandemic, when it's been so abundantly clear that those in poorer communities have suffered considerably more so than others. And in the light of the most recent debates, what would acting justly look like when some are still treated differently because of the colour of their skin, because of their ethnicity? It can't go on. Acting justly is what's called for from all of us as we seek to work out our purpose, why we're here. And what would it look like as we started all the more to love mercy? Might it be that we'd be engaged with forgiving much more than is perhaps the case? Might it be that loving mercy might require of you to forgive that person or those people who have offended you, who have hurt you beyond measure? Would love mercy involve reaching out to them and walking humbly? Might that mean that we have to listen more than tell? Might it mean that we have to begin to defer rather than insist? And might it mean that we move well beyond it's all about me? So I am a child of God, and so are you. And this God has plan and purpose for my life. And as for me, so for you. Go then and live. Our sins and griefs to bear And what a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what 
peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not care Everything to God and Our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Hello, my name is Susan Brown and I am the convener of the Faith Impact Forum. Faith Impact is really where the church hits the ground running. The job of the forum is to help individuals and congregations, presbyteries and the church as a whole to live out Jesus' call for all to have life and to have it in fullness. We're about caring for those who are on the margins in Scotland and in every corner of the world. And we're about caring too for that world itself. How do we pursue the peace and justice that Jesus called for, for people and for the world? How do we work with our Lord in transforming this world in the light of God's love? Well, we do it by listening to people's stories, by speaking out, by standing up, by reaching out, by holding, 
and of course by praying. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, since the beginning of time, you have so generously given to us. The breath you breathed in creation brought every living thing into being. Help us, we pray, not to take that creation for granted. Help us to care for it, to protect it, to nurture it, as well as enjoy it. Help us, Heavenly Father, to live responsibly. You have given us people too to share this world with. When we fail to notice the needs of others, when we don't hear their cries or see their tears, open we pray our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts and open our hands to hear and see and hold and help. Father, you sent your Son for the sake of all humanity. Inspire us to live as sisters and brothers and to live that connectedness generously and lovingly, enjoying the companionship of your people in every part of the world as we journey through this life together. Heavenly Father, just like your Son, plant in us a discontent with injustice. Give us the courage to stand against what is unfair and help us to reach out to those who are suffering, suffering through poverty or prejudice or oppression or war. May we dare to speak out for change in systems and in societies that perpetuate such suffering. And may we model that change in the way that we live as individuals and as a church. Give us the courage, Lord God, to love even as we are loved and to do so in the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. And so send us out, Lord, with your blessing, with your favour, which lasts from generation to generation and extends to our children and to our children's children. Send us out, knowing that we are children of God and that our purpose is in serving you Show us how you would have us live. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon each one of you today and forevermore. Amen. to